So these are, we will be discussing um, propositions and ballot measures that are endorsed by the California Democratic Party and the Marin, Marin Democratic Party. Uh, these are issues that are really important to us um, this year, so we want everybody to be one informed voters, and hopefully by the time you leave here tonight, you will feel like you're so informed, you really need to get out and get to work and come down here and make some phone banks or walk your neighborhood and let everybody um, know that they need to get out and to vote. Anyway, first uh, tonight, just to get started, we will be um, discussing Measure A, and Measure A is the Marin County Emergency Communications and 911 Response Measure. Uh, speaking on behalf of that measure, uh, the Marin Democratic Party has endorsed a yes on Measure A. Uh, speaking will be Larry Chu, the Vice Mayor of Larkspur City Council, and Richard Pierce, the Fire Chief of the Tiburon Fire Protection District. Thank you. Thank you. you can use it, you have to turn it on if you want to use it, but I think... Did my voice carry? Did anybody yes. have my, my you hear okay? New York voice? Okay. I gotta get away from microphones, they just love me. So anyways. Uh, my name is Richard Pierce, I'm the Fire Chief of the Tiburon Fire Protection District, and I'm also the President of Mira. Mira is the Marin Emergency Radio Authority. It was born back in 1998, where governments throughout the county got together with the idea that we could do our emergency communication system much better. And by doing that, it's really the model of shared services uh, with regard to our communication system. And what it did was it took all these separate entities and all these separate radio systems throughout the county and brought them together under one big umbrella. And what it also did was it, it brought us into this interoperability or communication system that we're all on the same radio channels. We can switch between different channels. We have tactical frequencies. And it comes in tremendously handy. Every time you read the newspaper on any given day, any police or fire or emergency or rescue response is part of MIRA. And MIRA is that over, overwhelming support. Um, back in 1998, we had these grandiose ideas of the system and how it's going to work, and there are some, some, some lessons learned in that process, I will say. But that being said, it's been a remarkable success. And what we're looking at doing now is to upgrade the system, to improve our response times, to um, better provide the interoperability, take advantage of a lot of the technological changes that have taken place over that same time, and then also ensure that we have the communication systems in the event of the larger events that, that's going to be providing uh, our, our communication needs. So, um, Measure A is a, uh, a piece that we appreciate your support, and um, tonight we're here to answer any questions you might have. But Measure A is an uh, annual $29 parcel tax. It's to uh, replace the capital of the infrastructure of our communication system. In 2000, um, 2018, uh, it's anticipated that our uh, system will become completely obsolete. Um, and by 2021, we, um, oh, sorry, I have so many dates in my head. But the uh, FCC is going to be taking back the current frequencies that we're on. So uh, we need to go to a 700 megahertz system. And that is it's basically making our system obsolete. And to be on the front end of this thing, this is not a system that you can turn on with the flick of a switch. There needs to be all this infrastructure. We started working on this during the strategic planning program about four years ago, identifying what some of these challenges are going to be, and then started moving forward over that same time period. Multiple uh, agencies involved, 25 MIRA member agencies, each of them looking at some of the hard challenges to what, what this system would look like we didn't have the participation from each and every agency, and we all recommended, all 25 of us, that we put this before the voters for your support and uh, consideration. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Larry, and then we can have any sort of questions from you that we might be able to, to help. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really important that people need to ask on this measure is, what happens if it doesn't pass? Because you've heard people in the public and in the newspapers say, well, it doesn't pass. Mirror's going to do it anyway. That, that's true. There's a fiduciary responsibility to provide emergency response to 911 and the 911 system, and it's uh, you know it's a responsibility that all the cities and towns and special districts uh, have to provide as part of uh, you know the, the emergency response and the communication service. But 
without this assistance from the property owners, what it means is that it still needs to be paid for. And we expect that if you take a dollar figure, and I, if you raise your hand and said, I'm in San Rafael or I'm in Nevada, I can tell you what Nevada pays now and multiply that by 5.3 times. Over the course of 20 years, wherever you live, that city has to look for a way to offset 5.3 times the amount of expenditure on year that they currently have uh, right now. And that's going to mean a reduction in, in uh, local services, in local programs. Uh, you know, it'll be up to your, uh, you know, guiding boards and councils to decide how they want to do that, and that's something that they'll probably go back to individual residents. You know, the, the other thing that people have said was, um, well, why didn't you pay for the second generation? I, I kind of view it like a car. You know, Marin, it's easy to say, I'm gonna pay for my car, and I, you know, we're very affluent here. But most of my friends can't do that, not the ones who don't live in Marin. They have to finance it. So while they're financing it, they're certainly not paying for their next car. They may be putting money aside after they've paid off that debt. But we're in that situation now because Mira was funded through a bond by the member agencies the first time. And the second time, we're asking the public to help fund it because what we can do then is that when this payment expires and, and the bond is paid off for the first generation, and that's in 2020, we're going to be asking the board to approve that the payment that we currently make now will then be set aside for money to do the, uh, you know, the upgrades when it's time for generation three. So, you know, th those seem to be the key issues that are raised, um, you know, as that you'll see in the paper related to finances. You know, you've also seen other things come up about uh, pension reform. This really isn't a pension reform issue. It's more a position that our opponents are taking to uh, force municipal and other governments into saying, okay, you can only work with what you have until you solve this problem. But if you look at Dick Spotswood article the other day, you know, he said, you know, there are things that you, sh you should be funding within your own, uh, you know, budgets and, and managing your own money, but there are things that cost so much that they have to go up get finance in this situation here. So hopefully uh, we will continue to have uh, the support of the Democratic Party. We're appreciative that they endorse this measure. We know that we did not get, uh, let's just say, a unanimous decision from those who voted the last time, and we're certainly here to try and address each of those questions and issues and concerns that you might have about uh, either the system, how it's used, how it's being paid for, uh, the fiduciary aspects of it after this passage, you know, like we're going to have a citizens advisory committee that will be reviewed by the county finance director on the end of the case, so all those types of things. So, um, at this point, yeah, yes? Is um, the homeowner's going to be um, funding this with a property taxes? Yeah, it'll be $29 per year for 20 years. So, right now, um, where I live, we vote for a use district for the 911 for getting um, the ambulance and things like that. If, if this does not pass, are you suggesting that money is going to be broken off, some of it broken off to help pay for this new upgrade? Where do you yeah. live? I live in Santa Anita, right behind the city center. Okay, that's the county? Yeah, it's yeah. Santa Anita. So what's going to happen is that since the county funds near in the unincorporated portions mm -hmm. of the county. Um, it's just a budgetary thing that doesn't pass. You know, they will end up needing to put more of their general fund money into NERA since the homeowners are not paying for it. And it's going to be just evaluating, okay, where are we going to have to cut back? Right. So okay. it'll be a policy decision from the board of supervisors. Exemption for seniors, or is that just school parcel tax? Yes, there is an exemption for seniors. I believe it is uh, for 2014-15 is 52515. So if your household income is below that number, then and you're uh, you know over 65, you can get that. Oh, so 50. I was going to ask that next. So what's the age limit for a senior? Because different 
places have different definitions of what a senior is. <laughs> yeah, this is used to be the uh, same form as the library text that was used in the past uh, in last year. Okay, well, but there aren't any more questions. You know, we're finding out that people who like it really, you know, continue to support it. So if you like it, get out there and vote. If you're still kind of on the fence about it and you need to think about it some more, uh, go out to the website at Marin for for org and if, uh, there's an email link there that you can ask your questions or you can just look at the material that's already out there. And if you don't like it, well, rather than have us offset two votes, to offset your vote, just don't go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
to the No on 45 campaign. Kaiser, uh, I believe they, uh, Kaiser Permanente, Permanente has contributed, I believe, over $14 million to the No on 45 campaign, yet they sit on over $21 billion in reserve, while many, many ordinary Californians struggle to, to make their health healthcare premium payments on a monthly basis and you know it's only getting worse so so you know in terms of uh, you know how this has affected um, you know uh, California I think small business tends to be a generator of jobs we can probably all agree on that um, and uh, there's been quite a bit of, of difficulty in terms of keeping costs down for small businesses they're being impacted quite a bit uh, you know what we see is uh, last year I believe substantial number of small group of individual uh, plans that, that you know, small business people are, are, are in, are enrolled in. I believe, I believe this specific plan had over 200,000 people. They saw their premiums increase by about 23%. And you can imagine the kind of strain that, that puts on a business. But you know, also, too, I think um, you know, the, the nurses we work with, you know, as uh, Pat said, I work with the California Nurses Association. They're seeing patients have to make tough choices in terms of what they're able to do. Um, and, uh, you know, as an ancillary uh, uh, kind of uh, manifestation in their development as part of ACA, we're seeing the narrowing of networks. So these health insurance plans, you know, uh, you're seeing increasingly higher costs, but ne networks getting more and more narrow, which means reduced physician choice, which could mean reduced uh, choice of, of hospitals, maybe not access, be able to access certain specialists that you need for, for um, you know, ailments that have been diagnosed, which is very problematic. And so when you put that within the context of having to pay more for that, 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 can, be, that can be quite a burden. Um, so anyway, uh, kind of moving on here, you know, what is Prop 45? What does it do? Um, many of you, I imagine, have lived in California for, for quite a while, correct? You may remember back in the late 80s, there was something called Prop 103, Proposition 103. It was uh, created shortly after um, auto insurance was made mandatory. Um, kind of similar to uh, you know, health insurance is now mandatory uh, with the ACA. Not a bad thing, you know, but, but nonetheless, you can imagine if you have a captive audience and you have the ability to raise rates, um, what can people do? What can they, simply what can they do in those situations? You have to pay or, or you know, maybe you face the consequences. Um, so what Proposition 103 did was it sought to basically force um, any, you know, auto insurer to, uh, to basically submit their rate increase for public review. So uh, we're kind of extrapolating that model onto to healthcare. And what it does essentially is if, say you're a Kaiser Permanente or a Blue Shield or a Blue Cross, Aetna, you know, name one of the major insurers or, or whatever insurer, Basically, if you said, okay, hey, we, we're going to raise our, our, our rates, we're going to raise rates for, for our small group of individuals, uh, and whoever else, uh, and this is what we're doing, uh, what this, what Prop 45 does is say, it says basically you have to justify your rate increase. You have to make, um, first of all, the justification, the rationale for that rate increase public. Um, uh, you have to provide all, all documentation, all necessary documentation. So all this sees the light of day. It's not decided in the corporate boardroom. It's not decided, you know, amongst a, a group of executives. Um, it's actually put forward and subject not only to public review, but public hearings as well. So we as citizens have oversight. Now, if they fail to justify those rate increases, um, what happens is this. Our elected insurance commissioner, um, Dave Jones in this situation, or whomever in the future, uh, would have the right to say, the ability to say, we're going to deny this rate increase, it's excessive. There's no rationale, there's no justification for increasing the premiums to this degree. And so, so essentially what you have is, you have more power for, for consumers and the public to say, hey, wait a second, let's put the brakes on this, this is excessive, it's too much, and it's not warranted. And so, it actually adds an element that people like uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Barack Obama and other significant politicians, and as well as community leaders and activists, have said needed to be part of the ACA all along, which is some sort of cost control, rate review, rate justification component to this to this law. So, 
I think the important thing is uh, that's what Prop 45 does. That's exactly what it does. Um, it puts uh, the affordable into the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it's, it's a necessary measure um, that will help protect consumers. Um, so, so that's that's really, you know, and it's, it's, it's not anything that's, that's unusual. You know, like I said, we had uh, Prop 103 for car insurance. Uh, we've had that for years. It saved California consumers over $100 billion since it was enacted. 35 other states have actual uh, rate review and uh, rate justification uh, and the ability to say no to excessive rate increases. Uh, and it works in those 35 states. Um, so, so it's it's definitely something that 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 can help consumers and has helped consumers in the past. Um, uh, you know, as you can imagine, it's, it's it's been a very contentious campaign. I imagine some of you have seen uh, some of the commercials on the No on Forty Five side, and there there are a lot of claims that just just are not rooted in fact. So, um, I'll take you back uh, down memory lane quickly. Do, how many of you remember the health care reform? Uh, stuff that, that Hillary Clinton was trying to do in the early to mid 90s. Very vague. Yeah. Do, do you remember the, uh, there was a famous commercial that basically, Harry Louise. Harry Louise, thank you. You remember, I, I think most of us do. I was a pretty young guy in my mid 20s, but even I remember, uh, you know, just how, I mean, that literally torpedoed that healthcare. I mean, that was dead in the water. Well, it just so happens the very same campaign consulting group that, that, you know, gave us Harry and Louise, they are now giving us the No on 45 campaign. So I'd like to pass on a recent mailer. Uh, I'm going to share this with you because I want to go through a couple of these things just so you have the facts when you're talking to your neighbors, uh, your friends, your colleagues. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just give you a stack if you want to pass that on. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing I'll tell you, sorry, I'm going to keep uh, myself here. So I want to walk you through this uh, real quickly. Um, you can see on the cover here we say why, you know, it says we oppose, we oppose Prop 45, okay? Uh, there's a position here, and this is kind of like, you know, I give you kind of the idea of what Prop 45 is, and I'm, now I want to give you an idea of what it isn't, because this is a very good guideline of what Prop 45 is not. You see a physician here. Uh, this physician here claims that medical decisions should be made by doctors and patients, not by a politician who can take millions in contributions from special interests. Proposition 45 has absolutely nothing to do with uh, medical decisions between a physician and a patient. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, you know, how care, a care plan is delivered by a registered nurse. We represent uh, you know, nearly 90,000 registered nurses in the state of California. We are very, very much in support. And I've also left uh, a, a op-ed by a physician uh, here um, by the name of Dr. Paul Song, uh, who states exactly what Prop 45 is. And what it doesn't do is it does not in any way intercede between a physician and a patient. Um, what it does, again, is it seeks to say, hey, insurance industry, insurance companies, you want that rate insurance? Uh, you didn't want that rate hike for the premiums? You gotta justify it. You gotta tell us why you're doing it. You gotta let the public know what's behind it, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. And if it's a justified rate hike, well, you know, just like there have been justified rate hikes in the car insurance industry, um, yeah, then that, that becomes reality. But hey, sometimes it's a little excessive, and, and we need to say no. Uh, this here you see also, because of a loophole exempting large corporations, um, Prop 45 unfairly hurts small businesses. Well, the fact of the matter is, um, large group plans are administered by the um, Department of Managed Care in California. It's been that way for quite a while. Small group plans, individual plans, they come under the purview of the insurance commissioner. What this doesn't say is there actually is a movement afoot to uh, get rate review and, and uh, rate justification. There's something called Senate Bill 1182, which actually was just passed recently in the California legislature. It's a good start. Um, Campaign for a Healthy California endorsed that bill. Um, we did a lot of lobbying. We did uh, some, a lot of support in terms of reaching out to legislators. And, and uh, we want to do both. You know, we think everybody across the board deserves the same fair kind of uh, uh, treatment, but the fact of the matter, we have to go about it in two different ways. Um, and we have to put the door now with the large group plans, and now it's time for Prop 45 to go through. Uh, so the other thing, too, is uh, they, they, you probably saw in the ads, 
uh, Prop 45 will in interfere with the independent commission. Have you heard that one? The independent commission is going to negotiate our rates and they are, they are going to be absolutely undermined by, by you know, Proposition 45. Well, what is an independent commission? Uh, you know, who, and who, who, is, who is it comprised of? Who, who composes the independent commission? Well, the independent commission, uh, you know, a lot of people, they're all political appointees. Uh, they are not subject to our votes. They are, uh, you know, they work at the pleasure and discretion of those that appointed them. Um, we have, they have no direct accountability to us. Uh, and currently, as it stands, that independent commission, they are, these are all folks who had, <coughs> bear with me, sorry. <coughs> Um, these are all folks who have a, uh, they, their backgrounds are with the insurance industry. That's where they came from. And it's not an indictment to say, well, they're going to go to some back room and get in cahoots and it's going to be double dealing, this, that, and the other thing. But if that's where you're coming from and that's what you know, and again, you have nothing in the Affordable Care Act that, that gives you kind of that leverage at the negotiating table to say, hey, we're taking a hard line here and we're not accepting what you're proposing here in terms of rate hikes. You know, the fact of the matter is the independent commission, depending on the composition, we could see it go in a way similar to the way the Public Utilities Commission has recently gone in California. And you may know about what happened. How many people here know kind of what's been going on between PG&E and the Public Utilities Commission? <laughs> Frankly, it's disgraceful. Um, there were, uh, uh, discussions going back and forth between PG&E, there's a series of emails, it's, they've all been released now, um, trading favors, uh, hey, uh, you know, we need your help with this ballot initiative, you know, PUC saying that, if you, if you help us out with that, you know, you know, maybe we can work something out. Hey, well, it just so happens we have a rate hike we want to approve, uh, we want you to approve. Well, that's a deal we can live with. This is literally the dialogue that's going back and forth. And so we never ever know, we never ever know when these so-called independent commissions can go south. Because truly, again, you're not really independent if you're beholden to a, a politician, be they Democrat, be they Republican, you're beholden to them. <coughs> what can we do in that situation? We can't, we, this gentleman, um, you know, with PUC who made some of these decisions to do these things, we can't vote him out. No, we can do. We can call for his resignation. So far, he's refused to do so. But anyway, point being, we need direct accountability. And we know very well, if our elected insurance commissioner uh, ended up siding with the insurance industry in these, in these types of situations where rate hikes, rate hikes were excessive, we would say, hey, you're not looking for our, our, out for our best interests, and we're fed up. And so we'll see you at the polls. Thank you. Just getting over a sinus infection and a little bit of water issue here. So my apologies. Um, so, so basically, that's you know that's kind of uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, independent commissions really aren't truly independent. But imagine this: if Prop 45 passed and you were covered California, and you were at the negotiating table and you were saying, "Hey, it's time to negotiate," uh, you know, and you're coming to the table of power because you know, <coughs> you know that you have a law that's backing you truly, and this exists in 35 other states. Uh, you have a law that says, "Hey." If, if your slide proposals across the table, and for any of you who negotiated at a real table, what you need is leverage, you need power, you need something backing you. Um, you can always say, like, hey, we don't like what we see, we need something better. And, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, if we, if we can't get it done here at the table, you know what's going to happen. We're going to have to have this reviewed by, by the insurance commissioner. All this stuff is going to go public. Everything you put across the table to us is going to see the light of day, and we need to get real about this. It actually gives you leverage to negotiate. It doesn't undermine you. It gives you leverage. It gives you power at the negotiating table. So these are things that already work in tandem in 35 other states. And you know, as Californians, we're, we're very, I think, proactive in terms of holding people accountable and holding them uh, to, to, to higher standards. And we saw it work with Prop 103. We can certainly work with Prop 45 in terms of keeping our rates down. So, so that's you know that's a, a small little tidbit about the uh, the elected insurance commissioners. You'll see a lot of other rhetoric on the on this uh, this mailing. Uh, you know, you know the, the the other. I think the only other thing, you know, some of these other points. Yeah, millions of people now have affordable health coverage with good benefits. It's great. ACA opened that door up for a lot of people. 
let's make sure that coverage is affordable. Let's make sure that we have oversight you know, and that we have the ability to hold people accountable on these issues. Um, the only other thing I'll say, you know, just I thought I'd maybe give a quick update on the campaign before going to Q&A. Uh, right now, obviously, uh, you see the commercials, you're probably getting the mailers. Uh, we are being outspent in a big way. Um, we'll never beat them with money. We don't have those, the same kind of monetary resources. They've, uh, the No on 45 side has spent uh, nearly $40 million on, on the No on 45 campaign. And you know, I'll just direct your attention to the small print here. Well, we see a physician, we see uh, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, and we see uh, someone from the American Nurses Association. By the way, the American Nurses Association tends to always side with the industry on these issues, whether it's safe staffing issues, uh, whether it's healthcare reform, they always tend to go on the side of, of uh, the market-driven industry. Uh, that's one of the reasons California Nurses Association actually separated from the American nurses because they were not advocating at the bedside for patients. They were siding with the industry on issues of, of patient advocacy and healthcare reform. But, so these are the faces you see. In none of these commercials do you ever see, though, an insurance industry ex executive. You never see that. You never see uh, the CEO of that, and you never see any of these folks. But when you look at the, the small print, what you see there is the same usual suspects. You see Kaiser, you see Blue Shield, you see you know, Aetna, it's all the same players. So when they say Californians, Californians against higher healthcare costs, that's the name of their foe, AstroTurf organization, you know what they are. It's the insurance industry. And if things like Prop 45 didn't work, if they truly wouldn't have the ability to stop health insurance increases, then why would they oppose them? I mean, a lot of this is common sense. Uh, you know, if it was strictly, you know, if it, if it was strictly benevolence here, uh, they wouldn't have raised our rates excessively in the first place over the years. Um, and, and so it's it's very it's, it's straightforward in that manner. So uh, in terms of you know they're, they're outspending us, but what we do have is we have people power. Uh, we've actually just, just done a, a series of ads, and tonight when you get home, uh, unfortunately the newscast is probably on right now, but we just got great coverage on channel two, five, and seven for uh, a press conference we did in San Francisco, trying to get the real word out about Prop 45. Um, uh, a couple of our allies uh, uh, spoke at this press conference and really spoke to the, the heart of the issue. So a lot of it, we, we have to, you know, we have to, to get out there and do a lot more grassroots stuff. We're doing a lot of phone banking. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, small group meetings, uh, community group meetings, uh, getting out there and, and going, knocking on doors and doing what it takes. Um, to, to really get the, 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 the true message about 45 out, apart from the spin and the Harry, Harry Louise style campaign. So, um, so any questions? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, first is, uh, what will be the order in negotiating um, if 45 passes between the independent um, commission and ACA and then to Dave Jones to negotiate after the Yeah, I think the way that would work ultimately is I imagine um, you know, there'd probably be some negotiations first. Um, but I think there, there would also, you know, in some of the details, I think Dave, Dave Jones would be probably the person to really answer this question because he's our insurance commissioner. By the way, he is doing some, uh, I think some town halls or some, he's been getting around the state. But my understanding is, you know, that, uh, you know, there'd be some negotiations and then maybe a simultaneous or a sh shortly thereafter, um, a submission of, of the rate hike increase to the elected insurance commissioner and made public. Um, and I believe that would have to be made public um, on the, uh, you know, on the, uh, on, you know, the website, you know, Dave Jones' website, and what have you. Okay, so. um, I have like two other uh, questions. One is, um, okay, so if um, Prop 45 passes, will it give Dave Jones or whoever appointed commissioner the leverage in negotiating uh, to also uh, address the, um, the problem with network coverage? Because you mentioned that real briefly, but will it actually allow him to negotiate um, 
about you know, the, the number of uh, doctors or Shrinking the networks, the narrowing of networks. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is not. That's, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, there's, it's funny, there, there's a lot of claims about what this, uh, what Proposition 45 does, um, which are most, you know, most of them are nebulous, negative, and false. That's one that I wish was true. Um, because that, that, that would go a long way in addressing a lot of the out-of-pocket costs that, that many patients uh, have to pay when their narrow network doesn't include a specialist who is going to be rendering the necessary treatment and care that they need. So that will always be with the ACA to well, negotiate those terms? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid in terms of, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I'll, I'll just be frank, it's kind of uh, part of another discussion, but we're also major advocates of, of single, single payer health care in California, yeah. actually. <laughs> and I, we make no bones about that, our coalition is, is for that, because we believe, and we know it to be true, that, that physician choice uh, as well as hospital choice is not inhibited in a single payer system. And that's the ultimate goal. And you know, there will be a time and place for that. Um, it may be sooner than later if some of these narrow network issues do not get addressed. But unfortunately, Prop 45 really won't deal with those issues. So, any other questions? I just want to add that uh, Prop 45, is, as Pat mentioned, was not only endorsed by the State Democratic Party and we here and the local Democratic Party are supporting it strongly. <coughs> There's a group of us that are phone banking specifically for that here at this headquarters. Every Saturday from 12 to 2, a number of us, particularly from Healthcare for All California, the uh, single payer advocacy group here in the room is very active in here. And uh, we call it Single Payer Saturdays. And uh, so come down and join us if you like at any time, but particularly between 12 and 2, you're likely to run into a bunch of us that are phone banking for Prop 45 specifically, and all the others, a uh, few supported by the California Democratic Party, but particularly Prop 45 particularly important to us. And Dave Jones is terrific. He's gone around to virtually all the Democratic parties, and they've all endorsed it. And this garbage about him taking million dollar contributions, no insurance commissioner has taken any campaign contributions from any insurance company for 12 years. And you know, uh, and to juxtapose that, it's, it's funny, a lot of times you know, with these campaigns, um, what they, what they accuse you of being guilty of, they actually do. And when I say that, when it comes to campaign contributions and greasing the skids with, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, you know major uh, uh, lobbying and, and greasing the palms of uh, elected officials with, with a lot of money, the insurance industry, they really don't know uh, much of an equal in that, in that regard. So, and you know, I know they've also talked about, you know, they try to trash consumer watchdog for um, for their intervener status on a lot of these issues. Um, they claim, you know, I believe Prop 103 that consumer watchdogs made eight million dollars uh, since eight or eleven million dollars since the uh, since Prop 103 went into effect for auto insurance, which when you think of like over 26 years, that's uh, that's a pittance. But juxtapose that with when I alluded to the 250,000 folks who had their premiums increased by 23%. You want to talk about big money? I mean, that's, I mean, we're talking major, major money here. And uh, and that's why they don't want 45, because they want that unabated, that, that absolute clear path to, to uh, whatever rate increases they so choose. Um, th thank you for bringing up the phone bank, because that triggers a little, uh, uh, triggers my memory here. Uh, we're also doing phone banking, which can be done remotely. Um, if you if you want to join our phone banking, we actually do have Wednesday nights we're doing phone banking. Um, we have a, a comprehensive list that we're reaching out to. And the beauty part, beauty part of this whole phone banking that we're doing is is uh, we're using the predictive dialer, which is very common nowadays. But um, you can do it remotely. You can do it from if you live in San Rafael, if you live in you know Sausalito, wherever. You can you can call in. We do a, a training which takes only 15 20 minutes. You can plug into the phone bank. And huge difference. And I will say this, our phone banking feedback has been tremendous. Um, we have a, uh, we got very, very um, meticulous in our select in terms of the, the universe that we were calling. And uh, uh, these are a lot of people are modeling and polling numbers. These are people who would be very vulnerable to these messages. And what we're finding is 70 to 80% of the time they're with us. But it's a numbers game. If we don't have people to call, we can't reach them. So, um, are there ads? And I know you don't have too much money, but you know, people that are less involved or engaged than we are will not look at that and say, oh, I mean, I don't think there's a single time I've seen that ad where I have to yell at the 
I know. Well, you know, some of you now, I imagine most of us here don't sit in front of the TV for hours on end, but maybe you have seen one ad from uh, nurses who are yes on 45, because that ad has just been released and we, we did the ad. So it's nurses who are actually saying, you know, I'm advocating for my patients. We need to stop the excessive rate increases. This is a burden on our, on, on, you know, the, those we care for. And so those ads are out now, and they're actually very well done because, you know, when you see watch the No on 45 ads, they almost look too polished. Yeah. They look slick, very slick. And when I see slick, I think, hmm, deception. That's the first thing I think of. But this is very, these are just ordinary folks, literally, who work in facilities right here in the Bay Area, and they're just literally out there because they really do care. And so you're gonna start to see those ads a little bit more. But as you said, you know, we, we don't have the same uh, amount of money for major ad buys. You know, literally, you can turn on the TV and you watch it for, for 15 minutes now in prime time, and you're going to see a no on 45. And, and it, what it does is it, it shows you just how nervous the insurance industry is of this because they are saturating the airwaves. They don't want this to be, you know, reality. I would say though, you'll start to see some of the ads, some of the Yes on 45 ads soon, um, maybe in an increasing amount because, hey, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's crucial. It's, it's kind of crunch time now. So, but anyway. Uh, so we, you know, one thing we do have, I, I did bring up, a, if you want, if anyone wanted to sign up for phone making, um, you know, I, we do have a little sign up sheet on, I can contact you if you're interested. We won't hold you in, to anything, but it would be great to, to have your help in, in getting this very important validation test. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. representing about 470,000 families that are dues-paying members of our organization across the state. We organize from the Oregon border to the border with Mexico. Um, and so we are um, helping to co-lead the field campaign to pass Proposition 47. And so the reason that I'm personally here tonight, though, is you know for the last 20 years, um, my father-in-law uh, has had a substance abuse problem. And so the first time that my son met his grandfather was in prison. And what happened, um, what began as a health problem, um, an addiction problem, um, has really spiraled out of control. And every time he went to prison, instead of getting treatment, my wife and I would go to bed very, knowing that very likely he had been tortured earlier that day. And so we have a moral crisis in California. We have a constitutional crisis. And we have a fiscal crisis. We have more people incarcerated in this state than anywhere on the planet. If you go further south of the Diocese of Fresno, you literally have more people incarcerated between Merced and Bakersfield than anywhere on the planet Earth. California this year spent more money on incarceration than we spent on higher education. And it has not made our communities safer. We have, it li literally, as we, it's interesting, people saw the Department of Justice just, well, I'll go into in the question and answer. So, we believe that part of the way that we can resolve this issue is by addressing some of the fundamental inequalities in our, in our sentencing laws. So, for many, many decades in California, we treated um, uh, drug, simple drug possession much more like it was a health problem. And it was a, still, it was a crime, but not a felony. But about 30 years ago, um, California began the sort of tough on crime, truth and sentencing, the war on drugs. We were sort of the, the launching point for, the, for this failed war on drugs. And that is what has been driving some of the highest levels of incarceration in human history. 
So um, Prop 47 is a very modest, simple reform that we think will create dramatic change that will make our community safer and that it will help really restore our priorities as a state. It does three things, there's the, sort of the three R's. The first thing it does is it reclassifies two primary, two um, non-violent petty offenses, so petty theft and simple drug possession. It simply reclassifies those from felonies to misdemeanors. There's still crimes, there's still consequences for it, but we're simply saying is that these, these crimes are not serious enough to warrant a, you know, incarceration at a state level that will impact the rest of your life. So that's the number one thing it does. We want to be very clear. It does not, um, it still, it still, you would still get multiple felonies if you stole a weapon, a gun, a firearm of any kind. You, you, California has the strongest drug law, uh, gun laws in the country. There is still, if you, if you are involved in repeated theft, you're, that's still, that's actually still a felony. But we're simply saying, if you're involved in petty theft, or some of the associated, like shoplifting, things like that, different categories of that, check forgery, um, under $950, that will be a misdemeanor in California, if you vote yes on 47. And simple drug possession, those two things, simple drug possession. Now that's determined by the, by the courts, but if the courts determine that you, are, you have been arrested, with um, drugs and they were only used for your personal use, that that will no longer be a felony in California, it will be a misdemeanor. And so by doing those two things, we will become the first state in the country to actually stop incarcerating people in state prison for these nonviolent offenses. The second R is that it's retroactive. So I don't know if, if, if anyone here knows anyone who's ever had a felony offense read about it in the paper, perhaps. Um, it has dramatic, dramatic collateral consequences. You know, I used to organize for about eight years in Richmond, California, and we, we did a, we did a, we, we interviewed um, close to 400 people who had been incarcerated for, who had been released between three and 18 months. And the, it was one of the, it's one of the only sort of uh, participant-led kind of study of what are the, what are people's experiences, their needs, formerly incarcerated folks we found that the unemployment rate is close to 80%. And now with, with uh, realignment, we're seeing those are similar statistics, 80%. And the number one reason that people are unemployed is because, uh, there is because of their, uh, they have a felony on their record. It makes it almost impossible to get someone to even look at your resume. So if this would take it, now again, if you have other more serious offenses, those remain, it does not change any of that, but if you, have, if you were, Arrested. We have. A, I was just in, in Stockton the other day. One of our clergy, uh, he stole $150 about 25 years ago, and he's had a felony his, that's carried that he's carried with him for that whole time. Even though he's, you know, he's a small business owner, he helps to pastor a church. He has, you know, grandchildren. He still has that felony on his record. So it would be retroactive if you if had been arrested. Um, for, for, for the, if you had a felony charge for those very limited offenses, those would become misdemeanors. And that would be, be a very simple process. You would simply submit uh, something in writing and the courts would do it automatically. It wouldn't be any kind of a burden on the courts. It would be very, very simple. Um, and that would be, that would impact, that would really positively impact hundreds of thousands of people. And then for people who are currently incarcerated, it actually creates a fair, it, it creates actually a more rigorous process it's what's known as the responsible release process that's, that currently exists. No one that's currently incarcerated will actually be released as a result of Prop 47, but they will be eligible. And if the courts deem that, the, the courts do a risk assessment and deem that, um, that they, this indeed, there, there is no uh, threat to public safety, then they, uh, they would be potentially um, able to be released early to be based on time served. The third thing it does is it reallocates. And so, um, as I was mentioning earlier, we invest you know, billions and billions of dollars in incarceration, and there's a formula that the legislature develops. So we, we say for every felony that is reclassified as a misdemeanor, the legislature, uh, the LAO calculated that you save about $20,000. So every time moving forward into the future, every time someone is charged with a new misdemeanor, that will generate a funding source into what's, what will be known the safe, to the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Fund. 
This money will not go into the general fund. It will go to three basic things. It'll go to helping um, invest and build out the capacity of our mental health and substance abuse treatment system. Um, is people all know this? Is this boring or is this like, does this make sense? Sure. Cool, all right, all right, tell me if I'm, you can edit out that part on TV. Mm -hmm. So uh, it'll go to mental health and substance abuse treatment. Why? Because that is one of the proven ways that we make our community safer is for people coming home from incarceration. Close to 70% of people in our state prisons have are diagnosed with either substance abuse or mental illness. And we have, you know, it's like literally our state prisons are the most expensive and expansive mental, mental health treatment facilities we have in the, in the, in the state. But this, this creates community-based treatment for folks with, with, with serious health problems that allow them to heal themselves and then, and then really reintegrate it successfully. And this was very important. This is actually 65% of the revenue will go to that. And that was an agreement we reached with all of our law enforcement partners who helped to draft this legislation because they know that this is what it takes to make our community safer. Can you explain that $20,000 figure again? So, where does the money come from? So, yeah, this you, you explained where it goes. We didn't explain yeah, that well, well, I'll tell you two other things. The other two, it go, a quarter of it goes to the State Board of Education, and it's, it's focused on helping, helping to fund programs to increase high school graduation rates, especially for, for students who are at risk of potential incarceration. And then 10% and then goes to the Victims' Compensation Fund, to fund trauma-informed care for victims of, of, of violent crime. So, because um, all those things, because we know that most of the folks who are offenders, uh, people who have been offenders were once victims, right? And what we're trying to do is really stop the cycle of violence and incarceration in California. So the way it works is it triggers, so essentially what will happen is every year, the, con the, the state controller will look at how many of these, uh, for these categories, for, for petty theft and simple drug possession, how many misdemeanors were charged that would have previously been felonies, and it will trigger a reallocation, uh, it's actually a new allocation into this fund, and that will happen once a year. From the general fund? Yeah, from the general fund into this, into this, into the, um, into this Safe Schools and Neighborhoods Fund. And it's, it's, um, 65% are in the mental health and substance abuse treatment is gonna be administered by an entity known as the Board of State and Community Corrections. It's like a, a state board made up of public safety and law enforcement officials and community-based service providers that then allocate, will allocate that money to counties, State Board of Education, and the Victims' Compensation Fund. Does that, does that yeah, make sense? Absolutely. So, um, what was, I was on the second, oh, I did all three R's, yeah. So here's the, the, the people who oppose us. Uh, you know, we try to make sure, so it's, it's the district attorneys, the, um, police chiefs and the sheriff's association. They're the same body, the same entities that have opposed every major criminal justice reform in the state of California for the last 40 years. And um, they, were, they have not yet been able to um, kind of communicate some of their message, but you'll see, if you look on their website, they'll say things that are just patently untrue, that, um, that this is going to allow people, like uh, I think what they're saying is uh, rape, this is gonna let rapists free, or it's gonna allow people to do date rape um, because of the simple drug possession. So if you, they're trying to, it's, it's rape is, is, a, is, a, is anything associated with rape, coercion, anything is, is a felony and you'll get multiple felonies in California. Same as if you steal a weapon, multiple felonies. Repeated that, multi, they're all, it's simply untrue and it's incredibly disingenuous, but they're trying to exploit a lot of the racial anxiety and fear that they've used for the last 30 to 40 years that, that have, that have that, and I think Californians aren't going to, and we're, we, we believe in the people of California that they're not going to um, be susceptible to that. Um, and, there's, and that's, uh, anyway. Um, so I, a real quick thing, like, do people know what is the drug most commonly used in day rape? What would you just guess? This guy, you, you could. That is correct, it's alcohol, right? So what the, you know what I'm saying? So there's like the consequence of their logic. It, it's completely irrational, and they know it, and they don't. But they're just trying to scare people. So it is alcohol. I'm sorry. Alcohol is the, is the drug most commonly used. This guy's here. Yeah, he's busy. Um, tell me your name, sir. I'm Dan. Dan, I'm Adam. Good. He's gonna do it next time. He's gonna do, do the presentation next time. Um, no, it's uh, it's alcohol, and so the logic. Uh, we make possession of alcohol a felony in California, it makes no sense. 
and I'll be frank, and, 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 I, and, I, and I, I apologize if there's anyone here that works for the, any district attorney, uh, office of the district attorney anywhere, but the district attorneys in California have done such a terrible job of protecting women and really looking at rape as a, as a very serious moral issue. It's unconscionable that they would try to use this, right? When this, pro, when this like, initiative is actually going like, to create a massive investment to help um, people who have been impacted by this. At any rate, so um, th that's our primary opposition. And then we have amazing support. So this is going to, I can guarantee you, this is the only measure, ballot measure, that you will ever vote on that is endorsed by Jay-Z, the Catholic bishops, Newt Gingrich, and Richard Trumka, right? <laughs> there is a massive, broad support. I work with the faith community. We have every major religious organization, every um, major uh, labor union. The, there's just a massive, broad groundswell. We're right now, I, part of, I apologize that I was late. We have close to like three to 4,000 volunteers that are volunteering every week, running phone banks and knocking on doors. Um, and it's only getting, we're, at, we're just, it's, we're, it's overwhelming the, the, the groundswell of support. Um, but we need people to vote this November. We need people to vote, with, you know, sort of vote their, the, on the truth, you know, what this is actually about. And um, uh, we, anything, I mean, we're grateful for the Democratic Party's support. It's been incredibly helpful. And anything that we can do to help. Um, I did bring some extra fact sheets, at, but, but, um, We've been targeting, we're really, our strategy, in addition to going out, we have a, a traditional campaign strategy, but we are really trying to talk to several hundred thousand low um, of folks who are new and infrequent voters. And this is primarily in poor and uh, poor neighborhoods and communities of color, and we're knocking on doors and calling folks, because we think if, if, if we can encourage folks to vote in large numbers, and then we can you know, continue to work a lot of the conventional channels to get our message out that this will be a successful proposition. And it will really begin to reclaim the priorities of California. That California can be a place of opportunity, where people are treated with real dignity, and where we can be proud of kind of the, the legacy that we're leaving for our children. Um, if we continue on this path, it's unconstitutional. So the courts are gonna literally, where we are right now is if we don't resolve this issue, the courts are literally, we will be required, the deal that, that has been struck, is that we will have to pay private prisons in other states and guarantee the bed space. So even if we don't have more people, we're still gonna be paying it to private prisons in others outside of California. So there's no reason, um, this is an urgent issue. What all the data has shown, California's on the right path. Um, the criminal justice realignment reform that will pass has only made our community safer. This is the safest our community that California has been in 50 years. We have the lowest crime rate in 50 years. Every major category, violent crime, it's all going down. And if we continue to invest in this kind of in real meaningful reentry system, if we, if we free up our resources so law enforcement focuses on serious crime instead of locking up people who have health problems or who are simply too poor. Another thing I was asked, what do you think in, in the city of Oakland, what do you think is the item that is the, the, the item most commonly involved in petty theft? What's the one item that you think, just, just off the top here, what do you laptops. think? Laptops. Laptops, right? Cell phones. Cell phones. You would actually, I have a, a clergy that I work with, her, um, her son who was 17 years old, he stole an iPad and he made a mistake and he shouldn't have. He was 17 and the district attorney wanted to charge him with a felony for stealing an iPad. Um, and his mother was able to fight and, and defend that, but, um, but it's actually, it's neither, none of those things. And I think we can all agree it's not right to steal someone's iPad. It's not right to steal anything from anyone, ever. But should a child get a felony? Would that have, you know, if that were me when I was his age, I can guarantee you no one would have charged me with a felony, right? Because of where I live and what I look like, but because he was in Oakland and African American, he was, it was a totally separate standard of justice. But the point of the, the, the question though is that it's actually diapers. Uh -huh. And when you look at the, that number, that statistic across the state, that is increasing. So we're locking up, and that's why, that's one of the reasons, it's not the reason, it's one of the reasons why women are the fastest growing population in our state prisons. And they would be actually women, it's women that would be one of the primary beneficiaries, close to 30% of the people impacted um, that are currently incarcerated 
um, are women that would be impacted by this legislation. So um, I'll stop there. I want to thank you again for, for taking time. I apologize um, for not being here earlier, but I'm grateful for, for folks that stay. And then I don't know if, if there's questions. I, I'm glad to answer questions. And I also, I also have some materials if people want to know how to get involved. We have, we run phone banks. Um, we're not, we're not doing, we're, we're focusing on like the 15 counties with the largest um, population. So we're in Contra Costa, San Francisco, Alameda, really all over the state. But if people want to knock on doors, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of beautiful folk. But I know you guys have a program you're trying to do um, in Marin as well. But are there any questions or? Just, uh, if it's okay, I'll leave some more fact sheets so you have them in case you need them. And thank you all. This is great. This is okay. All right. It's kind of like a no-brainer, though, right? Like after you, I'll be honest. Like I was in San Diego. San Diego is like the front on Saturday. It's like the front line, right? That's where the opposition is going to try to pour in. I knocked on like 70 doors. I had one person say no, and because he thought it was a parcel tax, he was confused. So I tried to explain to him. He wasn't in a good mood. So. But I feel like there's broads, the, the, one, the only thing that will hurt us is if we give in, if there's, um, if people don't vote, if people like you don't vote, it's the only way we, 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 um, we lose. So thank you for all you're doing and, and appreciate. Um, and good luck, look forward to celebrating with you in 20 set, 26 days. All right, thank you all very much, appreciate it. The theme that ran throughout tonight's discussion was the fact that Things that we want to see pass are, are having millions of dollars spent against them, and and the grassroots effort, the talking to people. If you don't want to officially be part of a, a phone bank, if that's it's not not your cup of tea, you can take some materials and share them with your neighbors and your friends and your family. If you're on the phone with someone, just remind them. We, we are concerned that this is going to be a very low turnout year. I mean, the indications are that that is going to be the case. We don't have key raises at the top that are exciting people that are, you know, they, they seem to be accepted that they're, um, that they, you know, what the results are going to be. So we need, we, but we need the turnout to get these other crucial measures and um, ballot initiatives passed. So hopefully you'll do whatever you can to, to work on that. And I thank you all for coming out for the, for the tonight. Thank you. Thank you.